Well, good morning. Thank you very much for your welcome. It's the uh, first time for Kathy and me to be among you, and uh, we look forward to sharing fellowship with you and uh, just sharing the Word of God together. Um, a man was in an accident, and uh, so I've just dropped the, the click out there. A man was in an accident, and uh, he slightly injured his shoulder, and he decided that um, this might be an opportunity to cheat the insurance company out of some money. And so he hired a, a dishonest solicitor who agreed with his plan, and they ended up in court. And the insurance company's lawyer asked, Mr. Smith, please show us how much your shoulder was injured in the accident by raising it, extending that shoulder, that arm, upward as far as it will allow. And the man, he raised his arm uh, to about that position and stopped, and he said, that's it. And then the lawyer said, Mr. Smith, will you please now show us how far you were able to raise that arm before the accident? And again, the man did, and he, <laughs> and he pointed straight at the ceiling. Have you ever been caught red-handed? <laughs> you were guilty, and everybody knows it. And, uh, well, I was the church youth leader 40-odd years ago who told um, the group of young people not to kick footballs in the courtyard of the stately buildings of the house in North Wales where we were staying for our week away. And then on the final day, <coughs> yours truly couldn't resist kicking a stationary ball, which to the teenager's amusement and to my great embarrassment went smashing straight through one of the mission's historic windows. <laughs> when we do something wrong, its effects are often far-reaching. Sin makes an impact. For me, it was more than a cost of a window. My pride and whatever reputation I might have had was severely dented. Well, in the Bible, there is a story of how Jesus deals with someone caught committing a sin, and it's in John's Gospel and chapter 8. Let me read this to you. Uh, John 8, verse 2. At dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered round him, and he sat down to teach them. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery, and they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. And Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Jesus asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said, and then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. What is con condemnation? Well, if you were to check out the dictionary, I'm sure you'd, it'd be described like words of criticism, guilty, conviction, words like that. And condemnation can come from God. It can come from the law. It can come from other people. It can even come from yourself, which we might call false guilt. 
Therefore, condemnation is when you feel guilty. You know you did wrong or fearful of the consequences, fearful of possible punishment or even self-rejection. You say to yourself, how stupid of me. How could I have possibly done that? How foolish. But you know, friends, God does not want his children to live under condemnation. In the book of Romans, it says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Perhaps we could say that aloud together. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Once more. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, in this incident that John records for us, the the scribes and the Pharisees interrupt Jesus' early morning Bible class by bringing in a woman who's caught literally in the act of adultery, red-handed. And there's no question of her guilt. She knows she's guilty. Her Her accusers know she's guilty. Jesus knows she's guilty. The only question is, how will Jesus respond? And parading this poor, terrified, humiliated lady in front of the congregation, the Jewish leaders, they challenge the Lord. They say, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to throw, st- to stone such women. Now what do you say? Literally in the original it says, you there, what do you say? They're trying to put Jesus on the spot. According to the law of Moses, adultery required the death penalty. And the way that death penalty was to be carried out was to be, the person was to be stoned to death. The accuser was meant to to throw the first stone, to wound the person, and then everyone else would throw stones until the person was dead. What, though, will Jesus do with this woman? And Jesus' reaction is totally unexpected. He doesn't answer the religious leaders. He doesn't offer a solution. Instead, what does he do? He begins to write in the sand. Jesus bends down, and he writes with his finger on the ground. And as they persist with their question, they keep at it, he stands up and he says to them, if any one of you is without sin... Let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stoops down and writes on the ground. And at this, those who heard began to go away, one at a time, starting with the older ones. You know, the finger of God that wrote the Ten Commandments and wrote a warning on King Belshazzar's wall in the book of Daniel begins to write again. We're not told what Jesus is writing, I like to think that he's, as someone suggested, listing the private sins of his accusers, of the lady's accusers. But, you know, sin has a way of coming to the, to the light. You can't hide sin. God knows all about it, as, he, as, as shown in the, the Garden of Eden, right at the very beginning. God knows about our sins. And when the men here saw Jesus' words in the sand their actual or metaphorical rocks in their hands felt very heavy indeed with their own sinful guilt. They couldn't throw stones at the woman and they certainly weren't going to throw them at themselves. And their plan misfired. They wanted to condemn the woman, but they were the ones who stood condemned. And instead of passing judgment on the woman, as these leaders had intended, Jesus passes judgment on her judges. And Jesus says, anyone here that hasn't sinned, they can go first. Notice that Jesus doesn't say, you better not throw stones at her. It's more a command. Throw stones if you are sinless. Jesus is saying to these men and to us, you're no better off than she is. Your hearts get filled with all sorts of things. You know, sometimes... Well, someone has said that there are times when, actually, if our inner thoughts were paraded, written on our heads, we'd go around with hats on all the time, wouldn't we? 
We wouldn't want people to know. We wouldn't want people to read what's going on in our hearts. You know, these men weren't qualified to accuse her. They weren't qualified to condemn her. One by one, starting with the oldest, perhaps because he committed the most sins, having lived the longest, they leave until verse 9, only Jesus is left with the woman still standing there. And so now that the jury has left, the woman awaits her verdict. What I find interesting is that the person who was qualified to point the finger at her refuses to do so. The only person remaining who could condemn her doesn't. The person who has the power to pass judgment amazingly acquits her. And the Lord Jesus speaks words of grace that she and we so desperately need to hear. Neither do I condemn you. Jesus, you know, never excuses sin. What he does is he forgives it and forbids it in the same breath. Go now and sin no more. Well, what happens when a Christian sins? I've just got six things to run through very quickly to share with you. There may be others. But what happens when a Christian sins? Well, firstly, the Holy Spirit will convict us. Do you know there's one prayer that God always answers, always? And it's this. Lord, show me what's wrong with me. What's wrong with me? The Holy Spirit convicts. You know, condemnation is bad. Conviction is good. It's God's way of bringing us to the cross of Jesus so that God might forgive us. Without conviction, we cannot change. And the second thing that happens when a Christian sins, people get hurt when I sin. My sin hurts people around me, especially those who are closest to me. And then thirdly, my sin hurts me. It destroys my happiness. You know, there are consequences. And those consequences can be emotional, they can be physical, they're certainly spiritual. And Galatians, Paul in Galatians reminds us that a person reaps what he or she sows. It comes back on us. And also, when a Christian sins, fellowship with God is broken. 1 John 1, 6, If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. I don't know whether you realize this, but relationship and fellowship are two different things. When you as a Christian believer sins, you are still a child of God. You're still related to him. To know fellowship is to know joy. King David lost fellowship with God when he sinned. He didn't lose his relationship. He says in his confession in Psalm 51, restore to me the joy of my salvation. He knew he was still God's person, but he was out of fellowship. And that's what sin does. It takes us out of fellowship, but not relationship. And then number five, our usefulness to God is restricted. Thank you. God, God can't use you so much when you're in sin. Uh, Jesus said in, in John 15, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Our fruitfulness for the Lord comes from being in harmony with him. And so we need our sins dealt with so that we remain in harmony with him. And number six, sin brings loving discipline from God. Our Heavenly Father corrects us. He doesn't punish us. Punishment and discipline are not the same thing. Punishment pays you back 
for the wrong you've done. Whereas discipline correct, corrects you in order that you would grow and change. Punishment always looks back. Discipline looks forward. And here, the, the accused woman, she needed hope for the future. And the phrase that Jesus says, go now, literally means from the now, from this point forward. Jesus is looking forward for her, not backward. He's ready to give her a new life, a new identity, his own power to overcome her life of sin. And Jesus passes the message on to us as well. But it's not written in sand. It's written in blood. It's not written by his hand, but by his blood on the cross. It's a message of grace. Grace gives us a fresh start. You know, Christian believers never need to live under a feeling of guilt or fear of punishment, or condemnation, or self-rejection. I love the truth of that verse that we said at the beginning. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You know, Jesus isn't interested just in what we've done, but he's also interested in what we can become in him. He loves us, and, and I'm so glad that actually... The Christian life, and I've been a Christian since I was 21, so it was a few years ago. I'm so glad that the Christian life is really a series of new beginnings. Let me give you three reasons why you don't need to live feeling condemned or guilty or fearful of punishment or rejected when you sin. The first reason is that God doesn't reject you when you sin. Jesus famously said in John chapter 6, whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. That's, his, that's the word of God to us, isn't it? God doesn't reject you because God's love for you is completely unconditional. As a Christian, I'm in Christ. Therefore, for God to reject me would be to reject Christ himself if I'm in Christ. The words in Christ actually appear 163 other times in the New Testament. I got up early this morning to count them for you. If you're a Christian, you're in Christ. You're always fully accepted. Sylvia reminded us this morning about the robe of righteousness. God sees that robe of righteousness. He sees our position in Christ. Additionally, God doesn't reject us when we sin because our acceptance by him is based on his mercy and grace that we've been praising him for this morning, never on our performance. Romans 9 says, it doesn't therefore depend on God's desire or effort but on God's mercy. Therefore, God does not reject me when I sin. The second reason I don't have to be fearful is when I sin is because God isn't angry when I'm inconsistent. You know, some of us might condemn ourselves for our failures. I, I have a confession to make. I'm a recovering perfectionist. As a joke, I used to be a perfectionist, but now I'm trying to improve. <laughs> you know, we make mistakes. We sin. We fall. We fail the Lord. We fail one another. But just as a parent is patient when their toddler falls over trying to learn to walk, so God knows I make mistakes. And, and what, does, what is his attitude? Well, it's Psalm 103. As a father has compassion... <clears throat> excuse me, on his children. So the Lord had compassion, has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we're formed. He remembers that you and I are dust. A Christian believer doesn't have to fear God's anger when they sin. And that, this leads to the next truth. The third reason for not feeling condemned is that God doesn't punish me when I sin. 
As I said, punishment is payment for wrongdoing. Jesus Christ took all my punishment for all my sin. Past, present, and future. And he did it for you too. When he suffered and died in our place there on the cross. So there's no reason to continue to torture ourselves about past sins. You know, once we confess a sin to God and receive his forgiveness, then it is a past sin. There's no record of it in God's book. There's no record of it in the court of heaven. You see, Jesus didn't come. Jesus, rather, Jesus didn't condemn the adulterous woman because he came to be condemned for her. He wasn't sweeping her sins under the carpet, just anticipating shedding his own blood for her sins. And that's God's solution for sin. Not ignoring it, not minimizing it, but taking it upon himself. You know, that morning, the woman was the blessed one. Her sexual partner may well have escaped. Her accusers left in a hurry when their sins were exposed. But at least she didn't walk away, did she? When you think about it, she was very courageous. You know, she could have left too. She could have slipped away when Jesus was writing in the, in the sand. But something kept her there. Grace, I believe, kept her there. You know, if you struggle to relate to God, then I want to tell you some good news. It's not about being good. It's about being forgiven. It's not about being strong. But it's about being weak so that God's strength can come in you and be displayed in your weakness. It's not about your perfection. It's about his perfection. It's not about your life having been pleasing and perfect to God. It's about the life of Jesus having been perfect and pleasing to God and now available by the Holy Spirit to come and live within you and me, changing us from the inside out. I want to end with a, an illustration. In my hand here, I have a torn, dirty piece of paper. Imagine this is your sin-stained, sin-damaged life. As it stands, it should be condemned to wherever sin-stained, sin-damaged pieces of paper go, the rubbish bin or, or the fire. But the Bible says, what does it say? There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now imagine that my Bible rep represents the Lord Jesus Christ. And if I now put this piece of paper inside my Bible, you can't see the paper. All you can see is the book. The paper may be torn, tattered, dirty, marked, stained. But all you can see is the book because it's in the book. And when you're in Christ, God looks at you and he doesn't see your sins, your faults, your failings. The, what he sees is Christ. He sees you clothed in that righteousness of Christ. And that's the good news of God's grace. There is now no condemnation. Amen? Amen? Let's pray together. My prayer for you this morning is that you would experience grace. Know today that whatever wrong you've done, no matter what it is, or what people think of you, you can be forgiven. For Jesus Christ has paid the penalty for all of your sin, and he he freely offers each one of us a full pardon. Father, Father God, I want to thank you so much for the liberating truths that we've looked at. 
Thank you that we don't have to go around being afraid, fearing you. Father, I thank you that you are not angry with us. Thank you that because we're in Christ, you love us and you see us clothed in robes of righteousness, your righteousness. Yes, Lord, you discipline us rather than punish us from time to time. Lord, when we sin, help us not to be afraid to come back to you, to face the facts and to admit it. Then help us to realise that you are never tired of forgiving us over and over and over again, that it only goes to show your wonderful nature. Would you help each one of us this week to live without condemnation? For I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.